Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, how's I? Good evening. To all of you in the room and all of you online, welcome. Glad you came. Um, hope we were able to get into this word in such a way that you would benefit. Everybody would leave better than they came. Amen. That's what the word tends to do for you. Uh, we said it when you tend to uh, grow. And so we're all about growth, so we're hopefully ready to be able to grow from this. <clears throat> As you know, we're going to be studying um, the book of Revelation. And the pastor's already kicked off the preaching um, series. Uh, the title is The Victory of Jesus and His Church. Uh, I'm using that same title. You might not see it much as I go through uh, because I prepared mine in a different time it has it So we're going to see how God mowed the word together. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, uh, Pastor, if I do say something, I'll stop it. <laughs> I don't want to be part of get the wrong message out. <laughs> so, um, Again, we are, I am Larry Fortenberry. I'm the facilitator for this next four CF sessions, uh, starting tonight and going through uh, the first Wednesday in August. Uh, the theme for the Bible study is Jesus has already gained victory over evil through his death and resurrection, but the church will face great tribulation for which the fourth victory is fully realized. I want to read that. Um, I see something to cheer about, but there's a point there that might make you have some anxiety. It says the church will face great tribulation before its victory is fully realized. But what we have to understand is that there may be tribulation, but because the victory is won, if we trust and as we see going forward, if we conquer, if we overcome all these obstacles, then we will not face much of that tribulation. Even though we'll be living in that time, we will be able to go through it. It's like those times when you are just troubling your spirit or you're down and, you know, but some joy kind of creeps up in there and, and, and you're smiling and people go, what are you smiling about? <laughs> you know, uh, this is the way it'll be. We'll go through these tribulations, but we'll have peace. We'll be blessed. So let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this night you've given us to come together and study your word. We thank you for those that you've sent to listen and participate. We thank you for the word because the word is enlightening and the word causes us to grow. We thank you, Lord, that that you allow me to have the opportunity to facilitate this class. I ask that you be with me, that you touch my mind and my recall and <clears throat> allow me to be able to not only say the things I planned, but even if you have other things, Lord, that I say what you plan, because I don't expect my plan to be final. So Lord, we just ask that you be in the midst, that you bless this class, and just bless everyone who participates and who listens. Because the Bible said those who hear, read, and obey will be blessed. Bless us all. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So just a little bit of um, reiteration. I know pastors went over this in the sermon, but some of you may have not been there in the sermon. So we're just going to touch on this real quickly as uh the who, what, when, and where of Revelation. Now, the who, the divine author, is Jesus Christ. The human author is John, the beloved disciple. This is John, the same John that was uh, following Jesus during his time on earth. The audience is the first century churches in seven cities of the Roman province of Asia. 
I like to extend that and say the audience is us. Uh, because we're still being blessed uh, by the word. So the audience is the church, the global church. Where? He was on the Isle of Patmos, a small island off the coast of Asia Minor. And when? About 95 to 96 AD. And why? He was there to encourage Christians facing persecution, false teaching, and seduction to compromise the surrounding pagan culture to remain faithful to Christ. And when I read this, it brings up some stuff for me, just looking at our current situation. Um, we have false teaching. Mm -hmm. There's persecution of the church going on now. We don't experience much of it, but you go into other countries and it, and it is it's severe. But the seduction, the seduction to compromise with the surrounding culture is one of the real challenges for me because what I want to do, I want to be able to love the perpetrator, the sinner, but not get caught up in the sin and not even appearing to my brothers that I've accepted those lifestyles. But I want to be there for my family who participate in the lifestyle. I want them to be able to know that they can come to me and we can talk. Now, I'm not going to agree with them, you know, <laughs> but I can pray for them. And I can also, you know, enlighten them. God gives us wisdom that I can share with them. So I, I just hope, pray they come to me before they go to someone else. Yeah. So just a little bit of the geography of the Isle of Patmos. Um, I think you guys can see it there in the middle of the screen. And notice where the stars are. Those are the seven churches. And they were in proximity to Patmos, to the Isle of Patmos. They were on a trade route. So you can see how the traders could circle around and, and uh, actually drop off at any of those cities. And this was a frequent route that was taken. And this would be the route for those people who would be delivering the letters to the church. The genre, as Tasha has already told us, is apocalyptic. Key features are it offers design perspective on history as it relates to the future. So when you're reading Revelation, even though it's prophetic and it's talking about things that to come, you will find that you won't understand a lot of it unless you refer back to the Old Testament. It's full of symbolism and allusion to the Old Testament. And I was wondering why, you know what? Why would you use symbols instead of just coming right out and see it? Then I got to thinking about what uh, scripture said about Jesus when he was on earth. If they recorded everything that he said, it would take book after book after book. But what we can do with symbols is especially those Old Testament symbols, because that was the Bible that the church had at that time. So they would have been familiar with those symbols. So, you know, it's like I could put up a symbol and ask you what it is, and you recognize quickly it's a Mercedes. I can put up the golden heart and say it's McDonald's. So, you know, you can use symbols to communicate in ways that you can use your words. For, uh, it was a prophecy. It is prophesying what is to come. And it's a epistle. It's a letter. A letter, letter to those seven churches and extended to us. So as we read and as we go through Revelation, I'll just encourage you to look for yourself. See if you can find yourself in the scriptures. See if you can find Mount Zion in those scriptures. And what you might find is that even though the churches had different problems, you might find that one particular church may have more than one of those problems. Um, those things that um, Jesus committed the churches for, we might find that we could be committed for some of the things that we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to be a gospel preaching church. We're trying not to lead people in the wrong way. So there's a lot of things that we do right. But if you look at just examine yourself as you go through Revelation, I think you would get the maximum out of it. <clears throat> I don't know. So, 
I got drum out tonight. <laughs> and get into the scripture. Now, one thing I want to do before we do that, I want to call out some reference scriptures. I want to ask you guys to look them up and be ready to read them when I ask. So, if I can get someone to get Matthew 24 36. 1 Peter 2, 9, Daniel 7, 13 and 14, Zechariah 12 and 10, and Hebrew 4 and 12. So let's read through this. Now, my slides tend to get busy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I want to capture all the ideas and I don't want to forget them, <laughs> but I want to be able to share them with you, so my slides might get a little bit busy. So, the scripture reads, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ even to all that be so. First question, why is this book called the Revelation of Jesus Christ? It's about Jesus. Hmm? It's about Jesus? Mm -hmm. God's unveiling to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Any other? Did anybody just look and say, well, it says it right there. <laughs> That's what I would say to somebody. <laughs> but yeah, you're all right. Um, the book is called The Revelation of Jesus because Jesus is both the revealer and the revealed. So what Jesus is revealing to John is about himself. He's revealing who he is and what is to come and his works. That will be in the future. So we must not look at it as a revelation of future events. There will be events, but let's not focus on the events. Let's focus on the message that Jesus is, is, uh, is uh, you know, bringing to us. So the Father gave the revelation to the Son. The son shared it with John, using his angels as intermediary. John wrote down all that he witnessed and dispersed it to us. So why did the father have to give the revelation to the son? You know, when we think about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit are one. <laughs> Um, he had, he yes. said earlier that all authority had been given to him. Okay. So, right. So, why did he not know about this revelation? I don't have an answer either. <laughs> 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 all right. Yeah. All right. I mean, he has to, like, when, when, I forgot what scripture it was, but when, uh, when the disciple asked Jesus, when will you be returning? And Jesus said, only God knows. Only the Father knows. Even the, no one knows when it will happen. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Yes. But so that's why it had to be revealed to Jesus. Because only, only God knows. Absolutely. What's to come. Before, before the resurrection, yes. Jesus was told to the disciples. Uh, and that's found in Matthew. 24:36. Can I get somebody to read that real quick? But of that day and hour knoweth no man, and no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Yes. So that did feel to me when I first read it unusual that Christ didn't know, but He did warn us ahead of time that there are things that only the Father knows. What is the significance of must in this text and how it encourages how is it encouraging to us? It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed, yes. Yes. 
Any other comments on that? So how is it encouraging to us? Because it's security, right? <laughs> 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 but you're right. <laughs> that should be encouraging. And, and, you know, when you look at the message that's coming, you know, and, and knowing that, you know, when we started out the study, we talked about the victory, you know. So if God says it must, then it will. And it should help us as we study Revelation because there are a lot of, uh, I would say, promises that's made in Revelation. And knowing that they must come to pass, you know, should be encouraging to us. And knowing that in the midst of all this ugly stuff that people think about the Revelation and, you know, all the, uh, I don't know, the, <laughs> the uh, violence and, uh, you know, things that we as humans can't overcome. It's comforting to know that Christ had promised us an outcome that would allow us to go through. And that should be encouraging. Verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. This should be encouraging, right? So John pronounced the breath blessing on those who read, hear, and obey what is written in this book. Read, hear, and obey. Now, in those times, it was common for scripture to be read aloud in the church. But just because one was reading it, one was hearing it, didn't keep them all from having to obey it. Okay, there was not just a blessing in reading it, there was not just a blessing in hearing it, but there was blessing in reading, hearing, and obeying. The word blessed is the same word used by Jesus in the Beatitudes. It refers to receiving God's favor and provision. And as we go through, once we get to those letters to the churches, you will see that God pronounced a blessing in every letter. This is not like the um, promises that many of our leaders make to us about, you know, what God will bless us with when we pay our tithes, when we, you know, <laughs> do right, and when we um, help the poor. This is not that kind of situation. What this is, is that we are going to experience what the world experienced during the tribulation. But we're going to be blessed. Because we're going to receive favor. God's going to make provisions for us. So as all this stuff that you heard about Revelation, and I'm not here to tell you it's not going to happen. <laughs> but I do know that God has made a promise. You know, Christ made a promise to us that we receive, we will receive God's favor and provision. We will be provided for and we will overcome. Again, that's encouraging. So if we approach Revelation simply to satisfy our curiosity about the end times events, we will miss the blessing. And I know many people I've talked to as we talked about Revelation, uh, they get caught up on the meaning of this and, uh, oh, this is happening now, the times are near, uh, and, you know, if not careful, you get anxious about stuff. When you really don't know when it's going to happen. God hadn't, you know, I mean, God didn't tell Jesus about that. So we won't know. Um, so, you know, we don't want to miss our blessings, so we don't want to read Revelation. I didn't say Revelation there, did I? <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, I, I thought I proofread everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. Again, we don't want to miss those blessings. No. Now, here the time is near speaks to the urgency of obedience to the word. This is not telling us 
that the end times is next month, next year. We don't know. It could be 2,000 more years. Okay. But the sense of urgency is because we also don't know our personal times. Okay. So we can't depend on something that's going to happen 2,000 years from now. We don't know when our last breath will be taken. And once that last breath is taken, it is over. So there should be a sense of urgency. <clears throat> and this is what John is alluding to as he talked about the time is near. Any questions or comments? Can I get somebody to read this next uh, text? Verses 4 through 6, I believe. Yeah, verses 4 through 6. Revelation. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so who are the characters in this text? Can you identify them all? John, the seven churches. Um, Jesus, mm -hmm. seven spirits before his throne. Mm -hmm. Yes, God. God the Father. God the Father. Mm -hmm. King's on earth. The King's on earth. Meaning us. Yeah, believers. Yeah. Now, I didn't capture them all, but I wanted to just go into detail about. Uh, some of them, but those seven churches that we see are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and the Odyssea. So since churches existed in other cities, Christ's selection of seven symbolizes completeness, implies that he addresses the whole church through these letters. You probably will not find what's wrong with the church as a whole in one congregation. Because we all have different, you know, we're different people, we have different uh, backgrounds. We, uh, if you've been around Mount Zion for a while, you ought to be able to kind of identify and fall in line with the Mount Zion culture, you know, which may be a little bit different from the culture of the church down the street. Um, so, so God is speaking to all of us. The churches in Asia Minor were facing intense persecution and they needed encouragement. And this is God's purpose for um, providing that encouragement. So as we look at the characters, God. God is described as who is and who was and who is to come. God is eternally existent. He exists forever of his own accord and by his own power. He has no beginning and no end. Nothing caused him, and he is the cause of everything. Can you wrap your heads around that? <laughs> Don't even pretend. <laughs> uh, I know some of us, many of us who were, you know, technically trained or uh, trained as scientists in college and in school. You know, we are taught that uh, every effect, effect has a cause. And then we see this. And sometimes we question it. But one thing I learned about God is that he doesn't fit into any of our little pockets that we want to put him in. You can't logically explain God. So, what does it take to trust in him? 
faith. faith. That's what faith is all about. That's why the Bible talks about faith so much. That's going to be stuff that we can explain to each other, but we know it works. You know, it, it's like the man that was healed and, and, and uh, people were asking him and he said, I don't know. <laughs> all I know <laughs> is I was blind and now I see. You know, sometimes that's all we have to go on. All I know is what he's done for me. And that's your testimony. And that's what we need to be sharing with people. Because uh, people have the same problems that we may have already been through. So we can share with them and, and, and be able to uh, encourage them with that testimony. The Holy Spirit is described as seven spirits. The Holy Spirit is one person but it's indicated as seven spirits symbolizing completeness and perfection. Again, we will see the number seven throughout um, Revelation, and especially throughout these first three, four chapters. <clears throat> so Jesus is described as the firstborn of the dead. Jesus' resurrection to a glorified body is the first of many. It is a foreshadow of what is in store for the church. He's the firstborn of the dead. He received a glorified body. And we've got that to look forward to. Regardless of what happened here on earth. Regardless of who is running the country. Regardless of who is making the decisions about the government and about the schools and all these things that we have to deal with on a daily basis. One thing we can be certain about you know, is that what is in store for us. He's described as a faithful witness. So over and over, Jesus is recorded as declaring the Father, bringing people to the Father and letting people know the Father. Jesus, the only begotten Son who is in the presence of the Father, is perfectly suited to be a witness for God. How many of us have seen God? So if he had to go to court as a witness for God, somebody said, what do he look like? <laughs> you have to get back to that. I don't know. All I know is. And the fact that he is a faithful witness is common. And he's the one who loves us. Though some of the descriptions and revelations are frightening, we must remember that Jesus is ever loving. He frees us from God's wrath when we trust in him. Important piece here, when we trust in him. The believers are described as free from sin by his blood. Revelation is a depiction of Jesus' justified wrath against sin. Believers will not face that wrath because Jesus already gave his life to set us free. Again, more comforting scripture in Revelation. A kingdom of priests to God and, uh, God and Father. Every believer is a priest to God. Priestly duties include worshiping God, sacrificing to God, and instructing people in the ways of God. So when we talk about priests here, we're not talking about a position that's been set apart so you can lord over God's children. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if every believer is a priest, that means my pastor's a priest, my brother's a priest, my sisters in Christ are priests. When somebody get first Peter two and nine. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay. So as a priest, what are our duties? Show the God of goodness. 
to be a model for Christ. Mm -hmm. Think about the chief priest in the Old Testament. Do we have duties similar to that? They brought word to the believers. Yeah. He made sacrifice. Yeah. yeah. And so we are examples and representation of Christianity. But are we a faithful witness of that? <laughs> You know, as um, passed over the preaching on Sunday, and he talked about that. I wrote in my journal, Am I faithful witness? You know, like we say these things, we even read, I'm glad you brought up First Peter 2 9, but are we really living a life like we are a chosen race? Or do, we, do we see ourselves as that? Mm -hmm. And do we see ourselves as the image bearer? Do we see ourselves as the ambassadors? Of Christ right here on earth. Mm -hmm. And if we reflect on that and say, oh, I missed the mark today. Yeah. I missed the mark last week. So we gotta keep pressing towards that mark because the time is gonna come when we have to give an account. And so we need to be faithful witnesses right here. Right. Good point. Faithful witnesses. And because we are in those positions, we can't allow that title the priesthood title to go to our heads. Okay, so if you're going to be a witness, you have to be approachable. Amen. Amen. And one of the things I learned, and I can't remember whether it was uh, even given from Pastor Harris, but when I first became a deacon, I know <clears throat> I was talking about being nervous about it, and uh, the advice I was given was, love God's people. If you love God's people, you'll be successful as a deacon. If you love God's people, you'll be successful as a priest and as a witness. Because as a witness, you have a purpose. And when you are approaching people that might seem to be unapproachable, but if you are a faithful witness, you're going to stop and have a conversation with that person who is smelly, who hasn't had a bad for weeks. Maybe he's homeless, maybe he's whatever. Uh, or could it be somebody who rubbed you wrong and you don't like them. You got to put that aside. <laughs> Because to be a faithful witness, what you're trying to do is give them what you got. Mm -hmm. Allow them to be able to see Jesus for who he is and want to be saved. And you can't do that unless you know you love God's people. And, and believe me, the people that are sitting out there that are openly, God's dear creatures. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can't just say, well, God, people are the ones in the church. Uh, if we say that, then the ones in the street would never be in the church. If you say that, you see somebody in the street, and three weeks later, they're in the church, what are you going to say then? Yes. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And in that scripture, uh, it says that the Lord brought us out of darkness to his marvelous light. And so I think about another scripture that said, if I was too was out there doing the yes. same thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And God brought me to me out of that dark place and brought me to his darkness light. So I don't have the right to look down on anyone. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. And too, you think about we're all priests, you know, it's the priesthood of every believer. The other thing it does is it, it makes us all equal. I mean, there's no you know, back in the you know, it's only chief priests that went the priests could go into the temple and only the chief priests could go into the holy of holies. But we're all priests, so as we go out every day, you encounter people, you don't have to say, Well, let me call Pastor Because <laughs> <laughs> he's the pastor, I'm gonna call an elder deacon. No, you God has equipped you, right? Mm -hmm. All believers have that ability to go out and do these 
priestly duties uh, uh, on his behalf. Amen. Amen. So, verses 7 and 8. Turning to the reader. Behold, he is coming with a cloud, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wear upon us. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So, what we know is that Jesus' second coming will be from the air with the clouds. Yes? Is there any significance with the clouds? Um... One thing I think is significant was uh, when he, in doing the transfiguration, when he left, he went to the clouds. And the angels mentioned to the bystanders that the same way you see him leave, you will see him return. Now, whether the cloud is symbolic, there's probably some symbolism there. Yeah. The Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> I even subconsciously we always think of God being beyond the clouds, you know, beyond the uh, universe, you know, outside of all this. Uh, and knowing, you know, what you do about science and knowing the shape of Earth, it was puzzling to me, and I let it puzzle me for some reason. Until I was studying this, and, and and it just reminded me that this will be a supernatural event. Okay, so the people in China and the people in the U.S. will see it all at the same time. So it's supernatural. So you know, sometimes you have to get through that with logic. So <laughs> the world, everybody all over the world is going to see it at the same time. It will be supernatural. He will miraculously enable every person on earth to see him at the same moment. Another reference scripture, Daniel, chapter 7, 13 and 14. Yes, Rick. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall be, which shall not be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we see here, even in the Old Testament, this is prophesied. Okay, the vision that uh, Daniel had, that he saw one like a son of man in the cloud. So so who are the ones who pierced him? Who's the scripture talking about? Even the ones who pierced him will see him. Those who crucified him. Those who crucified him. In particular, Israel. Israel, yeah, the Jews, his own people, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I remember hearing the minister say that every time we sin, we crucify him over again. Mm -hmm. So the other one who pierced him. If we're not careful, we'll be continuing it. Here's the was important. I heard yes. it before it too, but then it was like Jesus ain't know the cross no more. So how are we continuing? Yeah, we sat in God when we need to sin, but the vision of him still being on the cross, he's resurrected. He's not there. So when we sin, what we do is make him going to the cross seem worthless. You got to think of it, you know, like that. He's not there anymore, but when we continue to sin, yeah. it 
was only he went to the cross for our sin, and we must look at our sin as the cross. Why he went. Right. And we have to look at this scripture symbolic also, because every one of the Jews didn't pierce him. In fact, he wasn't pierced by Jews. Okay, so this is symbolic of the ones who denied him. So can we say even unbelievers? Mm -hmm. The ones who and even unbelievers. Yeah. If we're using it symbolic and not, you know, like Tracy was saying, you know, no, we can't pierce him because he's no longer on the cross. But when you use it symbolically as he's talking about the Jews who denied, who lied, who, you know, caused them to go to the cross. Yeah. Uh, Zechariah 12 and 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants, inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him, and one as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Mm -hmm. So we see here, this is you know, symbolic of what the Jews did. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the actual piercing. Yeah. Good point, Jason, thanks. Yeah. I look at uh, the two verses. Verse four is God saying who he is and who was and who is to come. Mm -hmm. And then we go to the eighth verse, and we talk about Jesus, who he is, who was, and who is to come. The Almighty, sure that they are the same. They are the same in one, such as the Trinity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any comments on that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Jesus was pierced by his own subjects. Coming with the clouds will serve as witness and evidence that he that he lives and that he is who he says he is. Apple and Omega. Okay. This event was silenced. Any possible doubters, atheists, and agnostic would stand before him unable to justify their stance. Mm. If you said you don't believe in Jesus and all of a sudden he shows up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he shows up a little late for you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you can imagine how that's going to be to some people. Even people who might have been trained, who have come through the church, who have been taught and refused to trust in Christ as their Savior. And they look at it and say, why a chance? Man, <laughs> you know, that's even worse than the person out in the world that don't even care. <laughs> Most people around the world will be wailing with guilt and shame, knowing that they missed their chance offered. Aren't you thankful? It reminds me that, um, Texas with the, the, I remember the man who went. One went to the bosom of Abraham, the other one. And he said, for my, can I tell my brother? The, yeah. I can't remember, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Can you tell my brother? Are they already coming? So, sisters, are they already coming? Those of you who have been preaching to your family for years, keep on preaching. Don't give up. Yeah. Keep on. I think that last word that you have at the end of this bullet here, chant offer. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're here for. We're, we're supposed to offer the gift of salvation by sharing the gospel. And so we have to do that. But they don't, we don't want anybody to say, well, I never knew you did. Right. You know, right. we share. We came and told you about. And so we have to do the work right. of sharing the gospel. I didn't believe it might be on you. Right. I didn't know it might be on somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> you had the opportunity to share with them and you did <laughs> You know, faithful witness, faithful right? Faithful witness, yes, I, I recall when uh, my wife and I were for the census for it just moved. And um, it was a major move. Um, and it was the 
beginning of us having my son uh, in the household with us. Uh, and it was the perfect time for the devil to blow things asunder. What I wanted to make reference to was that at one, at one point I was really downcast and discouraged. I went outside and this man approached me. And um, out of, he asked me, I was by my car, he said, can I, can somebody can help you with you? And I had the hood up here, need to oil. And then, he, then out of nowhere, he just started testifying about Jesus. And he sensed my countenance. Yeah. And he just started testifying to me. And um, his name is John Jackson. Uh, and for me, it, after all these years, I said to myself, the outpouring of the faith we have in the Lord, our commitment to him should just happen. It should be just simply innate after a while. Absolutely. And we should share and don't think one way or the other as to whether this person is a good candidate or not. We don't know who the elect is. <laughs> Even now, like opportunities that people have taken that I've been encouraged, like movements we go to take a need to tutor treatments and you would think almost random people, but they're believers. Like one lady, she was uh, going through security, she's wanting <laughs> Anita. And so, but she's like, oh, the Lord's got you, right? you know, I know he's going to take care of your situation, right? So she's like a security person witnessing, right? <laughs> she didn't know us. She didn't know we're pastor, first lady, you know, none of that. But she was, that was an opportunity. And she was probably doing with a lot of people walking through security, right? <laughs> Just to make sure they didn't have no weapons. <laughs> but she was, she was encouraging because she was a believer. And we were just like, Amen, sister. Yeah. Yes, thank yeah. you for that, right? Man? We believe, you know. So it's just again, take the opportunity. Right. No matter what you're doing, yeah. right? Uh, no matter what kind of job opportunity you have, as Rick was saying, someone just walking by seeing a, you know, him at the car, you know, you take the opportunity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just from what I'm gathering is that some sometimes people don't witness because maybe a sense of failure that if you witness to them, they might reject you. Mm -hmm. But in the book of Corinthians, it says some plant, some water, but God gave the increase. It may not be your job to lead them into the kingdom, but you're going to plant that seed. Mm -hmm. Somebody else will come along and water it. That was that gentleman right there standing yeah. at his car. Yeah. See? Yeah, but who going to get the ultimate glory? God, because he going to give the increase. Amen. On a different kind of surgery. <clears throat> um, I had a co worker. He was an engineer, really a good engineer out of NC State. And um, we worked together and we got together and developed a little community group, service group for the school kids uh, to try to encourage them to do well in school. So we established a little organization. So we were meeting and we'd be around a lot of times, but she didn't go to church. And it would cross my mind once in a while to mention it, but it's like I couldn't find the right way to mention it. Okay. And then one day after work, I got home and I got a phone call. And she had been killed by her husband. Mm. Oh, no, no, no. And I just, mm. you know, that just tore me up because it's like, man, I should have just forced it if I had to. <laughs> just, just, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe I wouldn't have been successful. I don't know, but it, it was my job, you know, to get her thinking about her life and thinking about Christ. And I feel that. And, you know, that's, that hurts. <laughs> Verse 9 through 11. Can I get somebody to read that? I, John, the brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira, Thyatira and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So how does John relate to this audience? 
in Scripture. Part of the room. Brother, he stresses the relationship that they had as peers and not focusing on his authority as an apostle. Partners in tribulation. Oh, his John has been persecuted too, right? Partners in the kingdom. Every single believer has a role to play. We ought to use our gifts and resources and trust it to us for building up the body. Patient endurance. They share it in patience. Just like John, they had to endure the persecution. So why was John on Patmos? He was being exiled for preaching the gospel. Yes. Oh. He was being exiled. I'm going to the trash today. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think they exiled John because they couldn't kill him. <laughs> Am I right? That's but they right. tried to boil him in all. Right. And he didn't die. And he didn't die. But what they were trying to do was suppress the message. Amen. They wanted to stop the word from going forward Amen. because it was Amen. offensive to some people just like it's offensive these days. Mm -hmm. And some people take it as a threat and I don't know why. So since they couldn't kill him, they got rid of him. Yes. So how is God's providence at work? We talked about in the beginning how things must take place. Mm -hmm. And then you're saying, you know, he's exiled to suppress the message. But they put him in a spot so he can focus and concentrate on Jesus and get the revelation so that then his word can then just go out. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. At least he's in jail, but he's protected. Yeah. He's, 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 yeah. That was the same way it was with Paul, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. He's right. Oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> what a better place to write. Yeah, yeah. It makes you think that sometimes when God causes us to be in situations of either isolation or in quiet times or where things look different, one of the advantages, frankly, of even the pandemic, it slowed things down and allowed me to be able to receive what messages he needed for you. And that Absolutely. Yeah, no. So I know we're running out of time. I'm going to ask one question and hope. Uh, uh, you know, just see if there are any comments on that. Have you ever been in a situation where God took something that was bad for you and made a good outcome? Yes. Yeah. Anybody want to share? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can I get one person to share? Mm -hmm. um, I had a situation where uh, I was uh, due to a misunderstanding, I was a uh, resident of Wake, Wake County for about 30 days. During that 30 days, I kind of like felt like, uh, you know, I was going to lose my job, lose apartment, this and that. But while I was in there, I got attached to a person that was in there. And all of a sudden, it, it became clear what I had to do. And even being incarcerated like that, we had Bible study. And um, it became clear what my mission was. Uh, I was there to encourage somebody. I didn't know who it was, didn't know why. I just knew I had to. And uh, that was it. Once I got out, the job I lost, I got a better job. Oh, so the lady I thought I was going to lose, she's sitting right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, <man. laughs> So, so, yeah, God, I see God do put you in, in certain, in certain mm -hmm. positions, but we have to stand our ground. Yeah. 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 Amen. Now, this is good. <laughs> and uh, I am going to pick up where we left off at. We'll catch up between now and the fourth week. <laughs> but but I, I, really, I really like to do this. Is good. Thank you guys for, you know, your participation and, and you know, one thing I really love about facilitating Bible study here at Mount Zion is, is we learn from each other. I was recently sharing with someone that, you know, I was getting called to be an elder. And when I got up in front of the congregation, I was extremely nervous. And he asked me why. I said, you know, 
I got up in front of CEOs and, you know, I spoke, but every time I spoke, it was a situation where I was the content expert. Okay. okay. At church. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to go ahead and close. I'm going to uh, close out in prayer, and then we will take our prayer request and, uh, and, and go from there. Lord God, we're so thankful that you met us here. That you allowed your word to just uh, quicken our hearts and just bring joy, Lord, just listening to your congregation and them expressing uh, the type of witnesses they want to be and just sharing the love for you, Lord, just to bring us joy to me. So I'm thankful for this time that you've given us. And so, Lord, now I ask that you be with us as we go our separate ways, as we go to our home, we ask that you <clears throat> just continue to provide blessings for us, Lord. Uh, allow us to discern when you're sending us through those struggles. Yeah. Allow us to discern that you're still in charge. Yeah. Yeah. And on the other side of the victory, woo, there's joy. Amen. Yeah. Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. And so we just ask your continued blessings upon Mount Zion congregation, <clears throat> all those who attended here tonight and those that are online. We just ask that you be with them all, Lord, and just Allow them to just experience your joy anew. There's something about your joy, Lord. Yes. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yes. It took me yes. a long time to figure out what that meant. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you God. We love you. We send this prayer out for you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. Oh, thank you.